Welcome. This is a short lecture on Arab and, and Israeli interpretations. The dominant political theme of the State of Israel is the perpetual quest for security. Since the rebirth of Israel in 1948, Israeli politicians understand that guaranteeing Israel's physical existence ultimately overrides all other concerns. Consistent with the position of other Israeli leaders before and after, future Prime Minister Shimon Peres wrote in 1970 that the, quote, Arab purpose is all absorptive. The destruction of Israel and the annihilation or banishment of her inhabitants, end of quote. The Palestinian issue is a subject of fascination. For many years after World War II, most Western literature used the term Arabs when referring to the Palestinians. Before 1948, there were Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian Jews. After 1948, there were Arabs, Israelis, and Arab Israelis. A fierce debate over the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict continues to rage as historians elegantly maul each other's version of events. Pro-Arab literature sees the creation of the State of Israel as a terrible mistake and injustice. Those who dismiss any Jewish historic tie to the land echo the ideas of Arabs such as mid-20th century lawyer Henry Canton, who wrote that the Jews from the first century to the 20th century had almost ceased to exist in Palestine. Even the Jews of biblical times represented only an episode in the long history of Palestine. One group composed of mostly Israeli Jews calling themselves new historians are sympathetic to various Arab interpretations. These historians are critical of the so-called popular heroic moralistic interpretation of the War of Independence that sees the struggle as a Jewish David against an Arab Goliath. For example, Avi Shlam claims that Israelis' talk of security is a red herring, a distraction from real issues such as Israel's territorial expansionism. At odds with the new historians is traditional historiography, which is less disparaging of former Israeli leaders and more appreciative of the importance of religion. Even though it is generally sympathetic to the struggle of the Jewish people, this history is closer to the truth, argue scholars such as Michael Oren, who claims that the traditional historians examine historical events on their own merits, free of contemporary influences. One thing is clear, a book supportive of Israel, there is greater attention paid to the security issues that ordinary Israelis face year after year with the Arabs who take Islam seriously. With their focus on modernity, many academics are reluctant to pay much attention to religious beliefs, but scholarship on religion offers important insights in understanding the conflict between Arabs and Jews. Scholar Bernard Lewis writes of the discontents of the Middle East not as a conflict between states or nations, but as a clash between civilizations. Islamic leaders became infuriated that capitalism and Western democracy offered an authentic and attractive alternative to traditional ways of thought and life. Many were angry over the subordination of their culture to the West. A feeling of humiliation was due to a growing awareness among the heirs of an old, proud, and long-dominant civilization of having been overtaken, overborne, 
and overwhelmed by those whom they regarded as their inferiors. Arabs admired and hated Western productivity that supplied their everyday material needs. What modern daily items from telephones to automobiles were of Arab manufacturing? <clears throat> The focus on Muslim resentment of the West resulted in compelling explanations of Middle East conflict. In the mid 20th century, American religious studies scholar Wilford Cantrell Smith wrote of the Muslim spiritual crisis as followers of Islam struggled with the task of reconciling modernism with traditionalism. Since the Six Day War, American leftists sympathetic to the economic plight of Arabs increasingly took, took aim at the capitalist success of Israel. Political scientist Efren Enbar argues that Islamic and Marxist interpretations converge. Many Muslims saw Israel as an alien extension of the West and lackey of Western imperialism and thus a corrupting cultural and economic force to the Islamic way of life. But beyond the issues of land, population, and wealth, Israel's main offense to Muslims had to do with theology. Muslims could not accord full equality to the Jews or any others who did not practice Islam. In the eyes of many Arab militants, Jews are, quote, the brothers of apes, the killers of prophets, bloodsuckers, the descendants of treachery and deceit who spread corruption in the land of Islam, end of quote. Historian Paul Charles Merkley maintains that Muslims refuse to live at peace with Israel because it is, because it is the only non-Muslim sovereign state in the Middle East. By turning part of the Muslim world into non-Muslim, Israel achieved something Muslims believe is theologically impossible. The creation of the state of Israel is an assault on the credibility of Islam that cannot be permitted to stand. In 1948, Mus the Muslim Brotherhood, an Islamic political religious group, declared, quote, Jews are the historic enemies of Muslims and carried the greatest hatred for the nation of Muhammad, end quote. There are fatwas or theological decrees warning Muslims against doing business with Jews. Those guilty were regarded as an apostate to Islam. Championing the righteousness of a holy war, Muslims fought to protect and free sacred Islamic territory violated by infidels. To his credit, Benny Morris of the New Historian School argues that it is a mistake when historians ignore or dismiss the jihadi rhetoric of the Arab world. Walter Livingston Wright, Jr., historian of the Near East, told a study group in 1948 that Islam is not a religion as religion is conceived in the West. It is a totalitarian religion. It tells its followers what to believe, how to think, what to do. It is complete. It is a complete way of life, a complete culture. The contrast of the Islamic world and Israel was stark on important issues. For example, in the 1950s, there was considerable discussion on why slavery was still legal in Saudi Arabia. The slave trade was especially vibrant in Islam's holy city of Mecca, where public slave markets existed and were unfortunate on their pilgrimages, found themselves forcibly enslaved. Arab leaders found Israel a convenient topic to divert their people from problems within Arab communities. Militant Arab rhetoric put Israel on guard, and the perceived high possibility of war 
led Israeli leaders to speak of conflicts as, quote, no choice wars. Contra contrast to the rhetoric of Arab political and religious leaders, Israelis, Israeli prime ministers or foreign ministers had no wish and Israel had no capability to destroy its Arab enemies, which numbered in the tens of millions. But with the reality of wars, terrorism, and, act, and other acts of violence, Israel acted forcefully, actions that generated worldwide criticism. Finding loyal friends in the Arab world in general was almost impossible, but after 1967, Israel also had trouble in gaining reliable support from European leaders. For decades, various European leaders argued that Israel was a mistake. In his memoirs of his life among the Arabs, published in 1957, John Club pondered the future of what he called the Zionists. Will the Israelis, quote, be able 20, 50, or 100 years hence to maintain themselves as a foreign element on a beachhead on the shores of Asia, end of quote. Supportive Christians believed that their argument shared some common ground with those Jews who argued for the righteousness of their cause. In the early 20th century, a notable Jewish nationalist was Vladimir Jabunsky, who founded revisionist Zionism. Having impressive skills, he wrote two important articles in 1923 outlining the Iron Wall theory of revisionism. The following is Jabodinsky's policy in a nutshell. We cannot promise any reward either to the Arabs of Palestine or to the Arabs outside of Palestine. A voluntary agreement is unattainable. And, and so those who regard an accord with the Arabs as an indispensable condition of Zionism must admit to themselves today that this condition cannot be attained and hence that we must give up Zionism. We must either suspend our settlement efforts or continue them without paying attention to the mood of the natives. Settlement can thus develop under the protection of a force that is not dependent on the local population behind an iron wall, which they will be powerless to break down. And again, he's writing this in 1923, 100 years ago. Jabinsinski saw no chance of the Arabs agreeing to Jewish statehood. Thus, Jews had to rely on military force to establish Jewish settlements in Palestine. Critics viewed this as immoral, but Jabinsky countered, quote, a sacred truth whose realization requires the use of force does not cease thereby to be a sacred truth. This is the basis of our stand toward Arab resistance, and we shall talk of settlement only when they are ready to discuss it. End of, uh, end of quote. Now to conclude, in the end, many see the conflict as a spiritual rather than temporal battle. The reality of original sin meant that no activity was perfectly righteous and just. Sin and injustice would persist until the return of Jesus Christ. Thank you.